So it's really nice to see so many of you here. This is the first uh, presidential lecture that we have this year, and uh, as you as you know, this is a, a lecture series that uh, really where we invite uh, distinguished scientists, uh, a researcher, or and, and thinker that uh, really can share with us their their uh, research journey. And, uh, and also that um, specifically that uh, really kind of influence us in the what our culture here of interdisciplinarity. And uh, this uh, uh, lecture that you're going to hear today is really, uh, you know, hits all these points above. So I think it's really nice to have a, a lecture in, uh, in this, um, uh, you know, in the chemistry that really connect, connects a lot of, of these uh, uh, spontaneous uh, things that we see in, in nature, or maybe it is planned. We'll find out uh, from this lecture, I would guess. And uh, uh, so, uh, in the, with this spirit, uh, it is, uh, of course, my great pleasure to uh, introduce to you the speaker of today, Professor Riko Kuruda. And uh, some of you might know her, and uh, she, because she has been uh, uh, very active in different formats. She's a distinguished researcher, but also a very passionate advocate of uh, different things like science policy, education, women in science, and sustainability. So you might have run into uh, Rico in different ways. I have actually done so in Sweden. <laughs> Because, uh, because she's been also very active in, uh, in Europe and, uh, and um, especially in Sweden in, the, uh, in a different type of um, activities. Uh, of course, in, in connection to, um, uh, to the um, place where I worked before in Chalmers uh, University, but, but uh, uh, actually also in the... Um, uh, in the uh, uh, she, she is actually a member of the Chemical uh, National Science of Chemistry in, in Sweden, and uh, that is, of course, as an international member, and I've seen her also there in action. So, um, so what, if you think about uh, a little bit what um, uh, really inspired um, um, uh, Professor Kuroda to really go into this type of research, uh, it's. Uh, I would. Un I think it was uh, that you have said uh, that it. It was because you you were fascinated about that so few atoms could actually make such a, a really complex uh, nature that we have and and the diversity there. So of course that uh, was easy then to t that you would take t take you into chemistry and see how that all could come about. So uh, your PhD was uh, from the uh, University of Tokyo, uh, and then uh, Rico went to United Kingdom and continued there in, um, I think, first in, chi in chiral uh, tran transition metal complexes and moved on to more biological kind of anti-cancer drug uh, interactions. And, um, but curiosity took you back then to Japan again and uh, moved into um, University of Tokyo for as the first woman to really be appointed as a professor in natural science over there. And uh, there you, you have worked with a lot of um, different uh, aspects of uh, asymmetry and, uh, and really um, um, get, get you more into both the depth and the broadness and, and the applications of, uh, to understand the, the, how you connect the morphology across the macroscopic and the microscopic world, and, uh, and also boundaries with the, with the, between different disciplines using chirality. And so um, this, um, this has also taken Professor Kuruda into, to get uh, several awards, uh, quite a few of them. Uh, maybe I should mention some of them here. So uh, the Club of Rome, a full member, and, and uh, Sarushi uh, Price, uh, Sara, Sarahashi Price, sorry, to, uh, Molecular Chirality Award, and um, also um, she has the uh, L'Oreal uh, UNESCO Women in Science Award, and, and this also took um, Professor Kuruda in to become um, uh, also working for with gender equal society and uh, uh, in the prime minister's commendation of uh, efforts. So this is uh, uh, really 
a lot of things that, uh, that Professor Karuda is involved in and inspired and inspire others. So with that, uh, please uh, join me now to, um, uh, to give a warm welcome to Professor Enrico Karuda on, uh, on to come up to the stage, please. Thank you for one. Good morning and thank you, Karin, for a wonderful introduction. Can you hear me well? Okay. Okay. The title of my talk, Left and Right in Nature, Does It Matter? I put so many funny things. <laughs> it's in a size is just uh, strange, but of course, our hands, this is the amino acids perhaps. These are snails I've been working on. This is the embryos at fossil stage. This is really huge magnified crystal of sodium ammonium tartrate. Actually, Louis Pasteur worked on it. And this is the instrument I made. It's very weird, isn't it? There are two detectors. But there's reason for that. And this is some spectra. So I'm going to talk all about it. So if you're a biologist, you can sleep if I talk about uh, crystallography and spectroscopy. And if you are spectroscopist and crystallographer, you may fall asleep. You can while I'm talking about snail chirality. Well, I'm going to talk about this. First, introduction. I know you know about chirality, but chiromorphology as well. The second day, I talk about chiro, solid state chemistry. I'm a chemist, actually. And chiroptical spectroscopy. Fourth, I'm going to talk about chiromorphogenesis of snails and future work and acknowledgement. So, like this. Scientists use very strange terminology. Chirality, handedness. Chiro, achiro, non-chiro, enantiomers, diastereisomers, optical isomers, racemates, optical resolution, and also maybe chiro discriminations, all these things. I'm sure you all understand this by the end of my talk. Well, what is chirality? Because you all know it. It's just, if it's a two-dimensional world, scientist, if I mirror image of this, like this. I is the same, but others are reversed. But in fact, Chirality is defined in three-dimensional world, so it's even we shouldn't talk about two-dimensional world. So what it is, if the object cannot be superimposed on top of its mirror image, it's called chiral, just like a hand. Right hand, left hand is a different object. So hand, foot, shoe, and electromagnetic wave and molecules. This is amino acid. So you see it, D, L, and D. So when you describe left-handed, right-handed, we use D, L, or R, S. So dextro, level, rectus, sinister, this comes from the Latin word meaning right and left. Then this plus minus small d, small l, that is the result of interaction with the electromagnetic wave. Then there are many non chiral ones, like so. Outlook of animals, electromagnetic wave, molecules. Light can be chiral, CD. It's not compact disc. It's not civil diplomat. It's not cake delivery. It's not Christian Dior. What is it? Circular diagram. So I talk about CD, CD, nothing to do with compact disc. And electric field of circularly polarized light so consists of two perpendicular, but it's equal intensity. The difference is the phase. If it's retarded or progressed, pi over two, it becomes right-handed or left-handed circularly polarized light. So this is the color light. Right? Crystals also can be chiral. This is the very famous one in 1812, it's a long time ago. Arago discovered that coarse crystals can be chiral. 
I call this left-handed and right-handed. What he did is he put crystal between the two perpendicular, it's so the plain polarized light, and the crystal can rotate this way, dextro way, so this goes D or plus, but other rotates opposite direction, left or minus. And if you go to Paris, there's a bluebird arago named after him. So go and look at it. <laughs> then, what? The name, Karality, where does it come from? It's from Greek, ancient Greek word. This means hand, actually. So hand, Karality means hand. Who named it? In 1884, in Boyle Lecture, William Thompson named this. If the object cannot be superimposed on that, it's, let's call it Cairo. Do you know William Thompson? You know J.J. Thompson. But this is the same as Lord Kelvin. When he was knighted, instead of becoming Lord Thompson, he decided to be Lord Kelvin. So you know the absolute temperature in K, the unit, that based on his. Then, where Kelvin comes from? This is inside Glasgow University. And this area is a Kelvin Park. And inside the Glasgow University campus, this river Kelvin flows into. So he took the name from Kelvin. So if he decided to book Low Thompson, absolute temperature may be T instead of K. But he named this should be Chirality should be the word we use. Okay? Then I said, does it matter? Yes, it does matter. Left and right is important because biological word is homo chiral at the molecular level. All living organisms on Earth use molecules of a unique invariant on this. So you can see it. DNA contains D deoxyribose, RNA contains D ribose, protein, only A amino acids. To understand why it's important, I made this very strange principles. Shoes and socks principle. So you may laugh at this. Principle one, if you put your left foot in your right shoe or right foot into a left shoe, you will realize it immediately, because it's awkward, isn't it? No difference in the case of socks. That is true. Principle two, if a toddler wears father's shoes for fun, he or she cannot feel the left-right difference, as they are far too big. Principle three, a sock takes the shape of either left or right foot when worn. If you take it off, it goes back to non color shape. However, if worn for a long time, perhaps not washing it carefully, the part of big toe gets thinner. Okay? And I can tell someone, I'm doing this work, and they all laugh. So I decided to make science version. Principle one, chiral compounds display chirality only when they interact with chiral compounds or chiral electromagnetic wave. If they interact with non chiral objects, there is no chiral discrimination. The left shoe in the right foot. That's a lot of things. Principle two if order of magnitudes is different, there is no chiral discrimination, even chiral objects interact. I'm talking about the dimensions. You're talking about nanoscale, talking about 10 centimeter, and also wavelengths. Depending on the wavelengths, you can detect clarity difference. Principle three, dynamic clarity can be introduced to non color objects when they interact with color ones. This I use it for understanding the interaction of some molecules. I'm not going to talk about it, but some non color compounds binds to DNA. Maybe sometimes some small molecules antibiotics sometimes. Then chiral is induced because it's in the field, chiral electromagnetic field. Then it produces 
induce circular darkism. By doing that, I can detect it goes into AT region or CD region, but I'm not going to talk about it. So it is important. You can introduce dynamic chirality. And also, dynamic chirality can be converted to permanent chirality, hole in your big toe in shoe shocks, all right? So this is what I put it this way. So biological world is homochiral. As I told you, l amino acid in proteins and D deoxyribose in DNA, D ribose in RNA. Shoe socks principles one and two operate as a consequence. This is the aspart aspartame, and it consists of this L aspartic acid, and this is the methyl estate of L phenylalanine. This is 160 times sweeter than sugar. However, if you change the color of this, it becomes bitter. This is the fragrance. This is just a mirror image. This, but one smells like a spearmint. One is sort of caraway seed. Worst case is a drug. Thalidomide, perhaps you know it. It's left and right is very difficult to separate because it's very similar in chemical structures. So identical chemical structure except for the handiness. So they administrate both, but in fact, S is teratogenic and no side effect for R. So, but before they didn't know the importance, therefore, its drug is normally racemates. It's the mixture. So it's important in the pharmaceutical, agriculture, and also food industries. And of course, you wonder why the homocardial biological world started. Ordinary chemistry produces racemates, so equal numbers left and right hand. Molecules. Is that so on Mother Earth? Hmm. So they will do this, many hypotheses. It's really circularly polarized ultralight, violet light from the uh, cosmic rays, some clay minerals, something on the quartz crystals. There are many, many hypotheses, and it's very interesting. But I think we need some amplification mechanisms, just a slightly excess of one handedness. You have to make it to total uh, prevalence of one handedness. So some amplification mechanism is important. So, but I'm not working on this. So my main research is chiromorphology. That is the word I coined myself from the two words, chiro and morphology. Just to describe the research area, linking macroscopic and microscopic phenomena through chirality. That's chiromorphology. Now, this is a sort of illustration. And chirality is displayed ubiquitous in nature. Now, this is the order magnitude in meters in logarithmic scale. So 10 to minus 15, this is elemental particle size. 10 to minus 10 is Armstrong. We may be zero one by one meter to two meters. On the left hand side is the biological world, right hand side is material world, because they overlap, but just to make it simple, I just put it two separately. So, for example, molecules, crystals, and some genes, this is the polymers, and this is a sort of embryos, organs, and individual organisms. It can be chiral. And so I want to understand how the molecular interaction got into this macroscopic scale using chirality. So let's go into the chiral solid state chemistry. So this is this side. So one, if I have time, I go to a little bit about this. Crystallization from solution. No, this is the very famous crystals, Ripas II worked on this, and here, if you had a mixture of D and L tartrate ions from solution, you get crystals. If temperature is below 27 degrees, 
what we call spontaneous optical resolution. Only L tartrate get together to form crystals. Only D tartrates get together to produce crystals. So it's called spontaneous optical resolution. And Pasteur is fantastic to see these two crystals has a mirror image, hemiheder facets. The way the crystal face comes about has a mirror image. It's almost impossible for me to see it because crystal does not have this perfect shape. And this was actually found in the wine brewery at the bottom of the barrel. This is this one. That one was found in fermentation, not that one. Now, Scacci in Italy repeated Pasteur's work. He couldn't get it. This is a racemate crystal he got. The same equal amount of left and right tartrate ions because there's no air condition in those days in Italy. So the temperature was higher than 27 degrees. So I was wondering, you know, a crystal is made up of about 10 to 20 molecules. How molecules recognize chirality of their neighbors and organize to form either chiral or semic crystals. So I did the crystal structure determination of Scotty's and Pasteur's one. And what I got is non-chiral water molecules, ammonium ions, really the key to form hydrogen bond bridges. I tried to do static energy calculation, but this is tetrahydrate, this is monohydrate, so it's not that easy to compare. But this I did maybe before you were born. I did this, published this in 1981. Then another interesting result, crystallization from solution. This is secondary alkyl alcohols. It's known to be very difficult to separate left and right. You know, you get either 48 against 52%. You may use, you may make doused isomers. You use high temperature well, piercings, but I'm lazy. No, 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 I'm not going to that. I decided to use racemic mixture of alcohols as crystallization solvent. What is it? Okay, so this is the mixture of alcohol. I use this as a solvent. And I dissolve this just ordinary diamines and dicarboxylic acid. This is, has some uh, trick here because it's easily combat left and right, combat is what we call actual chirality. So energy barrier of rotation is very low. So what you do, wait for a couple of days, you get crystals. Look at it. It's 95% S, only 4.5% R. So you just pick up crystals and you distill it. You get fantastic color discrimination. So this is the idea. So you, ha you, you should get some new ideas. Maybe you, be, you should be lazy as well. So this is how I got it and did save us other uh, compounds as well, but what is it? Because this amine transfer its chirality to this dicarboxylic acid. So it's all twisted to AR form. Then crystal is really periodically located chiral discrimination point. So it's all lined up like this is screw. Then it's trapped 98% EE. It's here. So this is the beauty of this compound. So one is chiral and two is prochiral. So Jessica Lucia-Torius principles all oops, <coughs> go into one direction. So this is it. So it, it was really interesting. And water, just like Pasteur case, water is important. There's a water here. Now when I asked one of my postdoc, in, Dr. Imai, he didn't do careful work. He used the alcohol with water in it, and he succeeded. It. We did it carefully next time to get rid of water. No, you have no color discrimination, so you should do sloppy experiment. No, I'm not saying that. 
<laughs> but that's what it is. So it was really surprising. But water is also the key. Without this water, you cannot do this fantastic color discrimination. So it's a bit like uh, Pasteur's sodium ammonium tartrate. There are many other cases like this. And then I decided to crystallization by solid grinding. That compound, this, this, you just grind it. Okay, so I realized this yellow one is benzoquinum. This is the one man beats best than after. You start the pink hue. They keep grinding. You've got really strong red color. This is a charge transfer complex. And amazingly, this is the X-ray powder diffraction pattern. It doesn't go through amorphous state. You can see this is the charge transfer complex peak. This is racemic bisped and after peak. This is this air expanded. This air expanded. You know this is the diffraction angle, and benzoquinone peak sharply drops down, and concomitantly, the new charge transfer peak increases, and there is no sort of amorphous state. But it's very difficult to prove. And they said, no, 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 it, it won't happen. I had a difficult time, spent years to get this published. And what it is, but I persuade them, I'm not doing anything, just leave that charge transfer complex. Just leave it. And benzoquinone sublines. I'm not doing anything. But it just goes like this and just goes back to original racemic one piece better than after. So at last I showed them, they said, all right, it can happen. But before, because it's very, semantically it's difficult, but you're, by you're grinding it, you're melting it, you're dissolving it. But in a sense, molecules can move around, diffuse a new compound. So what are crystals? Okay, you can get crystals from solution. You get this, and this is the structure. You can see R and R sandwiches benzoquinone. In other part, S and S sandwiches benzoquinone. However, if you grind it, you can get this strong color. R and S sandwiches benzoquinone. So it's different crystal structure, also color the same. Because if you grind it, if in solution you get the most free energy, the least free energy crystals you obtain, because it's all dispersed randomly, here you retain the memory of the original crystal. So you get many fascinating crystallization by solid grinding. <laughs> I call this chameleon-like. This, from solution, you get either red or black crystals. From this, you add white compound A, B, C, D, depending on how they form, they gather together. Look at this color, beautiful color. Oh, this, there's no difference. Sometimes it doesn't form compounds, but it's really fascinating. So just to start, it's in the area. And it's not only for organic compounds. Transition metal complex also make these fascinating things. From solution, inevitably, Water molecule coordinates the central metal ion. So these are sort of hydrate compounds you obtain in the cases of manganese, cobalt, and zinc. But if you co-grind it, you get iron and cobalt and nickel case, you get three-dimensional polymer. But even in this case, if you anneal it, water disappears and you get one-dimensional polymer. But if you leave it, it absorbs moisture from air. It goes back to hydrate compound. I repeat it 30 times. So it is really fascinating. But it's someone else's uh, laboratory asks the students to do it. So. <laughs> and I, but it's interesting. And so it, some of them came to the cover of journals. And I'm going to skip the third one and go to this topic the reaction in the solid state. I realized there are two reaction pathways. 
First, it goes to trans isomer, then epimerized to go to cis isomer. And this is actually found by Schultz in solution reactions. But in the solid state, there's a different pathway. If the X is light atom like a hydrogen or a methyl, it goes just like solution, just the pass A. However, if it's a heavy atom, like bromide, iodide, it goes to this pass B. This is sort of spin orbit coupling. <coughs> so I decided to crystal engineering the product. <coughs> so make a mixed crystal. So if you put crystal uh, molecules under this influence of heavy atom, you got the pass A, but if you put under influence of heavy atom, it goes past B. Oops, it goes to pass B. So that's something interesting. Then I realized it's important to <coughs> do calculation. Sorry, I'm still suffering from cold. I want to measure CD, but CD is measured only in solution before. I desperately want to measure CD. So measuring caloptic spectra in solid state. So solid state provides a rich and unique chemistry, as you heard just now. So different from solution chemistry, we must characterize molecular structures and the dynamics in the solid state. And also in solution, there's an effect by counter ions. So depending on the counter ions, sometimes CD spectra is different. So, however, solid state CD spectra cannot be measured by commercially available instrument in general due to substantial macroscopic anisotropies that go linear darkism linear by the fringes. In solution, LB, LD is zero. So if you measure 50 kilohertz signal, you can easily observe CD. CD is circular dichroism, not crystal diode, all right? So <coughs> in my PhD work, I realized, oh, it's important to measure solid state. But at that time, I realized I can sort of by making a microcrystalline homogeneous to make a KBL disk, just like an IR, then you can randomize, then LBLD zero. So it's really started, one of the, one started the KBL disk method, and now everyone is using routine D all over the world. And also devised another method. <coughs> this is the Stephen Mason, actually, special crystal. This is a union axial crystal, you say, if you propagate light along the optic axis on the perpendicular plane, there's no LD, no LB. So you can use that direction, then you combine with KBL disk, then you can calculate rotator strength, transition probability. So that did my PhD work. But I continued work much later. I decided to use it so that it can be for general use, for general crystals on diff any type of crystal systems. So I adopted two strategies. Okay, this is a sort of equation, and I want to obtain the true CD out of this equation. One strategy. I measure all LD, LB, and Somehow I remove the LDLB. Because I can measure LDLB, I name this universal caloptical spectrophotometer, UCS. <coughs> so made UCS 2001, long time after my PhD. Then even the particle type one, UCS2 and UCS3. That has, I'm going to explain a little bit. And <coughs> Later, I measured, uh, made much on LCD, and I'll explain to you, but it's a very fast, direct CD measurement. So this is UCS1, and it may look the same, but I, this is analyzer, can be put it in, take it out. They have two locking amplifiers, you can detect 
250 kilohertz, 100 kilohertz signals together. And also, this is a sample rotation stage, like this. And this is also sample holder. Also, all these have some pattern. And I made this. And how I measure this? Now, you put the analyzer, and you, make, you rotate sample 360 degrees, and you pick up the position where the LB is 0. That is, LB maximum is 45 is maximum. Then you measure the front and back at that stage. Then it becomes like this. Now you see, these are minus plus, plus minus. So if you add these, you end up this. So this is how I planned. So this is one is, this is non cardinal film, but it shows substantial CD. But if you do this, this is just, you observe this, uh, maybe front, then you do this, become like this. You know, it shouldn't be any CD, so it's, I'm very happy it is almost flat. Then, it, unfortunately, the bottom one, it was published by someone, and it says BSC, so it's a mud cow disease uh, proteins, uh, very similar to prions. Uh, a BSA is very similar to BSA that, and prions, so bovacidam albumin. And it shows alpha helix in solution. It becomes beta sheet in solid state, but that is purely artifact. And if you measure, ours is film, solution, both alpha helix. So that sort of thing, you could do it. And there are many other examples, but today, if you're interested, I just talk a little bit about this, this CD. Now, this compound, it can rotate easily. It can be twisted R in way or twisted S way, okay? And you can use UV, and then you can make new compound. That's a color compound you can make. So this is a color compound. In solution, it goes 50-50. It's a mixture. It's always uh, going to either left or right, left. So from this, but in solution, in crystals, it's not easy to change conformation. So in a sense, it's fixed. Then if you do the reaction in solution, of course, you end up with racemic mixture. Even you do the reaction in crystals, normally we get racemic crystals because that is more stable. Packing is better. That is the energy. It's better to do racemic crystals. Normally you get racemic crystals. Therefore, even you do the stop the rotation, conformational change of molecules in the crystal, you get this racemic product. So I decided to do this with chiral host. Then you can make a duct crystal, and this chirality is transferred, this compound's chirality, and if you do the reaction here, you may get only one handed product, and that's the result. Actually, this is a single crystal, the single crystal reaction. So this is the chiral host, and this is a twisted one direction chiral guest, then if you do the reaction, that's amazingly 80% EE. You get so 90%, you get a very high energy selectivity. So again, it's quite old uh, work of mine when still I'm a chemist. <laughs> then, if you dissolve this host gas compound, there's no chirality here. This CD is due to this chiral host. There's no chirality. But if you measure KBL disk, the solid state CD, you get substantial CD from the guest that actually trapped in the crystal. Then, if you do that, the action, this is the one. Before started uh, light, UV, then five minutes, 10 minutes, you can see B 
beautiful isospecific point. So you can follow the reaction using this solid state CD. So that is one of the examples. And you know, remember I told you I've shown SOC principle three. If you can make dynamic chiralty, then you can make it a permanent one. That's what I did. You trap the conformation as a result of interaction with the host in the crystal, as if you put socks into your left shoe, left <laughs> socks in your foot into your left socks, and it takes adopt the shape, then you may hold. So you did a reaction to make a new carbon-carbon bond. So you cannot change chirality anymore. So this is the principle three. Okay. So that sort of thing. And of course, it's ideal if you can obtain chiral crystal, and of course, you can do it by changing solvent somehow. But it's the enantiomeric excess is not that good because it starts wobbling towards the end of the crystal, perhaps. Anyway, there are many exciting results like this. Another example, may I have a lot of time, i just take you quickly. This is actually <coughs> porphyrin. That is not chiral, zinc porphyrin. And make a KBL disc and just a drop of amine. Depending on the chirality, it starts to form sort of spiral, perhaps, I have not seen it. Chiral aggregates and started almost zero. Four days, it's come very strong CD. How did I find it? Well, my lab space was not big enough, so I put my CD just outside my office. When Victor, <laughs> he wants to measure CD, I had a guest. Well, could you wait half an hour or so, because I have a visitor in my office now. But uh, his guest is gone. He's gone home already. So he, he measured CD the next day. And we did see some peak. Oh my goodness. So we waited, waited, and after four days, it gets really strong. But if you measure that, it, immediately after you added this, there's no CD. So perhaps maybe good to go home early. <laughs> or you have your instrument in your office. So that's just the lesson you may know. And another example, this is the Alzheimer's disease is relevant to A beta, beta amyloid. You know it. <coughs> so it's a precursor, APP is creeped by beta secretors, but the gamma secretors sometimes creeps slightly differently. And this 142 is found in the Alzheimer's patient, disease patient, or a familiar Alzheimer's disease patient. So I wanted to understand what it is. On the left-hand side, this is 140. Right-hand side is 142, found in Alzheimer's disease patient. This is the solution state, and this is the cast film state. This is the langmuir brosette film state. Now, if you look at it, in solution, it's 70% of a helix, 34% beta sheet. When it goes to film, it's 4% only, and 40% becomes um, <coughs> beta sheet. <coughs> beta sheet is the one who forms aggregation to form to plaques. So it's, it is uh, worrying you had many beta sheets. But if you look at the 142, even in solution, you had just two amino acids towards the C terminal. It becomes more prone to aggregation. That is really amazing. So that's still some time ago. We published a paper. And this is a hornet silk. This is the film. So Paul talked about the crowded um, environment. This is a film, spin-coated film. If you expose this film to steam, it doesn't come out so nicely, but it's a cover in steam, and this is the quotes on top of a spin-coated dishonored silk. Now, five seconds, 
start to change from Alpha Higgs to coiled coil and come into coiled cross beta sheet. You don't see any difference by your naked eyes, but with my instrument, you can see this fantastic change. So don't you think it's interesting to do solid stage CD? And this is my UCS2 and 3, because I thought I want to measure gel or some soft things, but if you normally use the normal spectrophotometer, it suffers from gravity, it just goes down. So I want to place the sample horizontally. So this is how it goes. Light goes like this. This is for transparent CD, transmittance CD, and I put samples here. For others, I put integration sphere, and I can put powder. Then I measure diffuse reflectance CD. So it's really good to see just this is two and this is three. So still only in the world is the disquality. <coughs> this one example. This is a di diffuse reflectance CD. I told you earlier on, one man bispeta nafto in the benzoquinum, you made a charge transfer complex, and if you leave it, it goes back to original uh, crystal by subliming the benzoquinum. So anything happened, this is the piling case. And both are non-chiral, but it produces chiral crystal, either P41 or P43. Now, it had a very strong peaks, but if you leave it, benzoquinum sublimes, you goes back to original, no CD. You end up no CD. And if you look at x powder diffraction pattern, this is the charge transfer complex peaks. This is the original pattern peaks. Look at this. The time goes, just goes back to original. So even you don't, there's nothing happens, you have to worry, molecules in the solid state can move around, diffuse, change conformations, anything can happen. So that's sort of, I'll get excited about this. And this is again the dynamic transformation beta amyloid peptide. So if you put droplet on a cold plate and you start measuring CD, so during the time it evaporates and it goes to film. So starting solution, it ends up in film. Now, during this very short period of time, it suddenly changes from alpha helix to beta sheet. So this is the catalytic effect. So when you are talking about Alzheimer's disease, A beta amyloid formation, it is catalytic. We are not putting anything, any other component, but this A beta 140 itself sort of accelerate the aggregation. This is the, the second strategy, okay? So multi-channel CD. So rather than measuring LD, LB, I decided using electric shutter to pick up only the CD signals here, there. So <coughs> this is the nanosecond electric shutter, and you pick it up, and this is the equation, and you can subtract these two, you will see if you sub this is the same sign. So if you subtract it, you can get CD. So this is like this. This is two dimension things, detector. So you don't need any wavelength scan. You are using not the monochrome, it's a white ray. You use it and you can snapshot it and you subtract these two. What you get? This is CD by mouth channel CD. This is the ammonium sulfate. If you compare this with the UCS I measure, made earlier, yes, very similar. <coughs> However, signal to noise ratio is not that good. But I'm sure it's much better, much better C CCD. We must have, but I don't have money, I don't have people to continue to develop this, unfortunately. But <coughs> one thing I want to say is, it took five minutes to measure UCS. It's only seven seconds. 
for my channel CD, and I'm sure I can make it much shorter. Then I can follow, for example, the transformation, conformational change of proteins. That sort of thing. It's not that very fast, but just medium speed, the conformational change we can follow. So, now is the time for biologists to get excited about. <laughs> Sorry for long story about chemistry, crystallography, spectroscopy. But basically, I'm a chemist, and I try to understand this snail chiromorphogenesis with my chemistry background in future. But anyway, this is this. How genes get into the macroscopic shape. Now we know it. externally, we are all bilateral but internally asymmetric. You can see there's no left-hand dog because there's some exceptions. And our body, yes, lung is not actually mirror image, slightly different, only one heart, one liver, gut goes one direction. And this is determined really strictly genetically. It's determined. Of course, one in 10,000 humans has a situs inversus, completely mirror image. <coughs> Not known that much. And I was fascinated. How can they be? Actually, this is very recently. I took this photograph that's in my campus. It's beautiful. This is not, this is a moth. It's not a butterfly, but it's very beautiful. Uh, this, I found it in, in, in Sandai Turpet pap Papillion as a butterfly. It look, it's not mirror image. But not by later, but I have to, I got it from the internet. It's really asymmetric. This is actually hermaphrodite. One, is, one side is male, the other side is female. So this is something unusual. But this is very, very rare and something gone wrong. But I decided to work on snail. Okay? This is the show I picked up from the northern part of Kyushu. And Paola gave me beautiful snails, uh, shells picked up from the beach around here. I wish I can come back to, at least do some collaborating research as well as picking up shells from the beach. Anyway, most of shells is right-handed, but they are sinister only one. This is called Physocuta, but I decide to work on this freshwater snail, Lemonia stamnalis, because it's bimorphic. It's 98% dextro, 2% sinister in the wild. So I decided, oh, it's fascinating because we have a difference. So I decided to work on it. And so the reason why snails, why in particular Lemonia stamnalis, because both dextro and sinister species are found in the wild, and dexterity is dominant. And also, the symmetry, asymmetry displayed both externally and internally. You don't have to cut open to see if, what is the actual chirality, because it's so nicely displayed outside. So I thought it's fascinating. It's, it's a good target to work. And it's hermaphrodite, and that means it's both self-cross and cross. That is doing genetics. I think it's, it's simple. Simpler, perhaps. And snail handedness depends on the direction of spiral cleavage of embryos. That was reported 1894 by Crampton. And uh, this is a famous Morgan's is a book. It shows like this. If this is the sinister one, two third stage, four third stage, when it comes four to eight third stage, rotates this anticlockwise way, it becomes sinister snares. But if it rotates clockwise, it becomes dexter snares. That was reported in 1894. I thought it's really fascinating. Then, there's a body asymmetry follows a maternal mode of inheritance. So even you have a gene to become right-handed, but your mother is left-handed, your body is left-handed. So it's called maternal inheritance, but it's not mitochondria. It's in, actually in chromosome. And it says by single gene, but it is 1923 to 1930. 
it's 1953 is the Watson Creek double helical DNA. So in a sense, this is a Mendelian gene. But I thought it's really fascinating. I want to do work on it. And this is you know, my cutie snows. About if it's become big, maybe two centimeters. So what I did is the dominant dexter and the recessive sinister embryos are not mirror images of each other at the crucial causality determining step. This is almost my first paper, to 2004, because I was trying the chemist, crystallographer, spectroscopist. Now I suddenly decide to work on snails. I have to clean the dropping. What do they eat? What food I have to give? So all this. So it took some time. Anyway, so if you look at this. Uh, that the top one is sinister one, bottom one. Now it's really rotate. Fantastic, it's really very strong sort of torque. It rotates like this. I was very fascinated. It, it is the sort of similar what Crampton reported. But then I realized it's not mirror image of each other. For the dextro one, colority is developed all already at the metaphase. You can see the cell is sort of helically twisted, deformed, and spindles also follow that way. Then it, the small micromeres are formed, then it becomes like this. But for the sinister one, there's no chirality at this stage. It's almost straight. Also, spindles are aligned. There is no helicity, and the micromeres are produced just above. And when it creeps off, it rotates. So I thought, oh, it's not mirror image at all, although not every textbook wrote about it. Then I checked several inhibitors, inhibition of actin polymerization, inhibition of microtube <laughs> polymerization, and I realized actin is important. Spindle is tilted because the shape of cell is deformed. It's not the other way around, OK? So spindle is not pushing the cell. But first, axin is involved, and it's changing the shape. We call, I named this spiral uh, deformation and spindle inclination, SD and SI. So then I. Then in all textbooks, it shows like these figures. They are mirror images all the way. But I realized, no, there's, at this stage, symmetry is broken. There's no symmetry that important. However, if I compare this with sinister only fine circuiter, yes, it's a different species. But in a sense, there's a mirror image relations. So I hope that all textbooks still keeps this. I hope they will change to this. Figure. <laughs> then uh, it's a, really my first paper, but it appeared in Current Biology. Science also wrote about it, and it says very nice. The results of an exciting and elegant new studies refute this model, showing that right doesn't have to be the mirror image left. It's so nice. So I was quite happy about it. <laughs> then I want to understand. What is the gene? I try to understand. I try to understand what is the gene which is doing this. But before, I want to find out: is this really the single gene, or there may be many other genes? So, it took years. I because it can self-cross, and you can cross it. So I pick up the sinister and the dextro one. Then you cross it with the sinister one. Of course, first one is 50-50. You have, and it all has a left hand body because mother is left-handed. So you have to wait what sort of offspring children that produces. Then you have to pick up the one which produces this. Then you make this with self-crossed sinister one. By doing this, you can dilute the Dexter genes, for example, at F6, only 1.6% is dextro genome on average. 
and 88.4% is sinister genome on average. On, in that 1.6%, if this Handen's determined gene is inherited, it produces dextro offspring. By doing this, 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 it's really terrible, but I did it. <laughs> then at congenic F10, only 0.1% is dextro genome, and 99.9% .9 sinister genome. And if it inherits the handedness determined gene, it always produces SD, spiral deformation, SI, spindle inclination, and all become dextro snails. And all this, there's no exception. So I know it's single gene locus, the gene must be. So we did positional cloning to make the story short, but it takes seven years. <laughs> so uh, it was really hard, but I made a back library and FLP linkage. Then I did the quantitative real-time PCR analysis and showed 13 out of 15 candidate genes acts at the maternal effect. Out of that, I picked up actin-related genes and this is cloned RT-PCR, 5 prime, 3 prime, race, etc. Perhaps you know all this. But for me, it was really hard to learn all these things. But luckily, I had a lot of project. <laughs> so this is the part. Actually, there is no, this is an incombinant code region. There is, I could not get any recombinant one. So I sequenced all. Out of that, I told you 15 out of 13, and I picked up five. Only this dear one, actually, dear two is tandem repeated. Only dear one has a difference between right-handed and left-handed snail. But you can see from a distance, you, you cannot see the, read the writing, but it's a blue, blue red. You see, one blue, one C is missing. Okay? So what does it become? If it's one missing, it comes to stop codon soon, the frame shift mutation. So for the sinister snail, only dear two, dear one doesn't exist. But for the sinister snail, dear one, dear two, both exist. But these two has 89.4% homology. What is it? I'm still wondering about it. Then, of course, this is to make a Western blot, and there's no SDR1 for sinister one, and it just goes like this up to blaster state. You had the SDR1. And also for the congenic one, there's no nothing for the this congenic, but this one it has. So it's very clearly done. And you look at this for the another limonia, sinister one only the two, but the dexter one is both. Sinister only five circuiter or uh, in the pro bruno uh, one, it has only sort of type two one. So it's it in a sense it makes sense. But it's not a proof. It's a candidate. There may be some other factor required. So I decided to knock out the CRISP, by CRISPR-Cas9, the LSDR1 gene. And because no one succeeded in the mollusk, so I have to work hard, but lucky, I managed to do it. So this is in the world, there's a point mutation here. So that comes stop codon soon. But it's so similar, I could not set the target site here. So we made a target site, FH1 region, and did it make it <coughs> like this. <laughs> so this is how you do it, yeah? And you have to wait for the F2 stage, become homogeneous. Look at this. If both are really a frame shift mutation, it comes left-handed. If it's on the one side, is no frame shift mutation, it's happy become dexterous snails, no exception. So if you knock out one gene from the dexterous snail, it becomes the sinister snail, and now it's F16, 16th generation. So it really shows that. And this is the uh, rotation anti-clockwise. Clockwise also matches with this genotype. And also, uh, so this is how it looks like. And also realize the at the fertilized egg stage, already there is a chirality. So it's really fascinating. 
And in you know, our body, this is a case in mouse, it nodal in PTX determines our handedness in our internal body. The same gene operates downstream for this snare. And it becomes mirror image. So it's really fascinating. But then I thought, well, if four to eight cell stage, if rotates that substantially, rotate that way, this way, it, it determines the chirality of shell coiling. What happens if I push it under the microscope from four to eight cell stage? And all my students laughed at me. Oh, you come up with a strange idea. But I managed to persuade one technician. <laughs> Did it? And it works beautifully, so we had to push it earlier on for the dexter one because karate determines earlier. So pushed it under microscope gently, gently up to here. For this one, karate doesn't start early, so start pushing it up to here. Now it's amazing. We end up completely mirror image creatures, but it lasts only that generation because we have not done anything to the gene. Yeah? So it becomes like this. But next generation goes back to original one. And also, it changes the nodal PTX expression site, complete mirror image site. So it's really fascinating. Not only that, we used FISA cuter, sinister only one. Also, I could create dexter FISA cute as well. There are many things, but I'm not going to bore you. It's going to talking maybe nearly about one hour. So there are many things, but unfortunately, well, this will come out soon, but I'm doing the final <laughs> proofreading. So it will come out soon. So uh, I talked about this and also the same figure I put it. Then, what I'm going to do now. OK, this is the one. It's appeared in current biology, my first paper. Actually, nature paper, there's manipulation. It doesn't come out to the front page. But it's, this is also development. It's on the front. Now, this is a nature one, natural sinister dexter. This sinister one is produced by ma manipulation. Dexter one is produced by manipulation form. So it's meaning different. And this one, the right hand is a natural one. This by knocking out one gene by CRISPR-Cas9 and created. So it's all mean the different things that appears in the top. And we are like this, and it's a case of mouse and nodal flow. It's a really fantastic work in Hironaka and Hamada. And 8.25 day, the nodal produced nothing known for snail case. 12 hours after the first cleavage, it nodal is produced. We can put finger on what is actually happening, and I know. The carite is already determined at the fertilized egg stage before it starts the first cleavage. So we really want to work out how it is. And what the gene is doing, actually, it's the one, the aphanous one. It's a forming gene. It exists in all animals, all eukaryotes. It's involved in actin filament elongation. So why is it doing? And it's the one only. Oh, no, sorry, dia 2 only becomes sinister. Dia 1, dia 2 becomes dexter. Why is that? I try to put, understand it. Here, I may be using my spectroscopy, my chemistry, or get into a hope. And also, I try to do some um, genome editing using that technique. And I'm just trying to do two. One, just I'm going to finish before. I I'm working on snail bone. Neglected tropical disease that's so defined by WHO. And this really killing so many people, suffering so many people. Pradiscantia is sort of become resistant to this. As now become resistant to Pradiscantia. But this uh, intermediate host, the parasite requires intermediate host. It metamorphoses twice inside the snail. Then it comes out of cericaria, cericaria get into the skin, and that's it, you have it. Oops. So, this intermediate host, for example, Banfalaria glabrata, that's phylogenetically close to the snail, Riminia stung nice, I've been working on. So, I got an idea. 
I got a grant from NIH, R01, as a peer. That's the reason I could continue my research. And at last, after two years suffering, I, I could knock out one gene, try to uh, see how it yeah, effect the uh, sort of infection. So we'll see it by the end of this year. And another thing is I want to work on Alzheimer's disease, and uh, people will laugh at me, but I'm doing the conditional feeding, uh, aversion experiment test. And it's very clever. Sometimes it remembers 50 days what they had. And also, there's a quite beautiful asymmetry. Sorry, my photograph is not good, but it's a asymmetric brain. And also, there's no blood-brain barrier. So A beta is reported by the, this group, accumulate after 24 hours. So I really want to work. Does it affect memory? But my future work, if I can continue. Well, there's um, many people involved, and Imani and Sekir, they are sort of crystallographer, chemist, and these two are actually the spectroscopist. Uh, he was my uh, PhD student and become a postdoc. He was in Fukui University, and actually Harada Kun is, was his student at the master degrees. He joined my PhD group. So he was very close to retirement, but he was really happy, helped us, and also with Jasko. So these are the biology group main people. He was the one to very good, skillful technicians. He pushed it carefully, and we did exoboculture. We could do the exoboculture. That's the reason we could do the CRISPR-Cas9. He's a PhD student who found the mirror image is broken at that third cleavage. He's also involved in the position of cloning. He is good at the CRISPR-Cas9. He did so many things very carefully. But I don't have any of them. Actually, I have one, two, three, four. Uh, she's a lady who comes a couple hours a week to help clean in the tank. <laughs> and he, he's a postdoc employed by NIH, so he's working on uh, cystosomiasis. And she's just uh, a girl. She comes to do some final uh, undergrad project. So I volunteer to teach, and she actually come to do some taste aversion experiment. And uh, this is uh, Dr. Uchiru. So unfortunately, this is all I have, but I have no idea, and I want to do many more exciting things in future. So sorry, I may took a bit, maybe five minutes longer. So thank you for your kind attention. Okay. All right. Questions. Uh -huh. Do we have any questions? It was a fantastic talk. I'm really interested in the hierarchy of the snail. So you show that the spindle orientation is important for determinant de determination of hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So this spindle orientation specific to this stage, early stage, or after they have a different uh, orientation, do they keep uh, orient? Uh, here I'll call direction. Uh, okay, thank you for the question. <laughs> this is called spiralian, and we are not spiralian, so we readily cleaves. But spiralian always does this. Okay, so spiral way, spindle oriented, and that's determine the direction of small micromeres or some other cells to come out. So that is an important thing. But what I found is spindle orientation is not the first to determine chirality because the cell deforms and the spindles tilted accordingly. So that I proved by a sort of inhibition of polymerization of microtubules and also actin filament. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the fantastic talk. I have a question, general question. Is there an um, evolutionary advantage to, for one um, chirality or another chirality for the snail? Yes. Um, there is an advantage. Is maybe because of predator. Snail 
it has a particular shape. It's easy to corrupt from the shell. And if it's other way, it's difficult to get it out. So that's one advantage. And also, the sexual organs has a colorality. So you cannot mate easily. You know, I'm forced to ma mate for this. <laughs> but if it's slightly a different shape, it's m more difficult to mate between left and right. But I could do it. It was very, very difficult, but you can mate it. And also, it's self-cross. But the so advantage is, because you want to keep the same, same chirality because of the sexual organs and happy to, but predator also takes the one chirality easily from the shell to take the inside out, eat it. So that is known for some species. You showed the maternal in inheritance is important. So the maternal inheritance correlated to the so evolutional advantages, so the attacking. Uh, Suppression attacking by the snail or snake or something? Oh, I don't know if it's related to evolutionary advantage, but definitely this is a maternal, and there are not that many maternal inheritance actually. And normally it's mitochondria is related if it's a maternal, but this time it's in the chromosome. It's a very rare case. I don't know there are other examples. But this is definitely maternal. But <coughs> maternal was actually described by in 1923 because they did incredible number of crossing. And uh, one is a diver. He's British and a sort of amateur scientist. He crossed it, crossed it, crossed it. And he thought, this must be maternal. And that is really true. So yeah, it is very fascinating. But it's difficult, isn't it? Because you don't know what gene you have. Because you are, you are, you are right-handed, because your mother is right-handed. But you may not inherit the gene. So which karate children I will you know, <laughs> produce? I have to wait for that. So it takes more time, one generation more. But it's, it's really fascinating. Yes, so left hand is all oh, asking questions, right hand doesn't. Yeah. What is it? <laughs> so I'm more here, left yes, yes, left handed. We are all left handed here. Thank you very much. So I have a very simple question about this uh, model. So in Y type, so uh, cell is deformed and the spindle is tilted and shows some uh, right handed spiral. But in the left side case, uh, no uh, orientation, but it shows different orientation. Yes, yes. Could you please explain why it shows? That uh, is a very important question. It's maybe due to the molecular chirality, I'm thinking. OK? So it must be something to do with that. But because it has no chiral preference up to certain stage, that means it's not robust enough. That's the reason left-hand snail has sort of more deformed snails will come out. Right-hand is very solid, robust, and maybe due to this orientation. Sometimes you can have slightly, you know, we are deformed one from left-handed one, but it's nothing to do with the gene. Just by chance, get some environmental effect, for example. So, but why it's all come up straight and then turn to the left-hand side, it's really fascinating. And you're just right to ask that question. And I think it's something to do with the cell-cell interaction and also maybe something to do with this action filament, maybe some other factor so I'm looking at cadiferin E and all others. So that made me to go into some other areas, you know, what is the metastasis in cancer and all this related, I think. So, so adhesion is important. But that is, that is a very good question. <coughs> OK, we're all left-handed here. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, thank uh, thank you very much. Um, I I kind of have a follow-on question, which which is so so when this chin is knocked out, they seem to come out left-handed. Now the question is: Have you ever seen? Is there ever a case where they where the chirality is randomly determined? So where you see 50-50 in the offspring? No, that's the thing. There, it's not 50. You may wonder if it comes up to straight. Why shouldn't it go left-handed, right-handed? No, it all goes to left-handed. That means there's a reason, molecular reason in it, I think. Mm. And in the world, it's all are one-sided. You know, most of them, the right-handed snails, it's, there's no exception. The limonoid, limonoid is a very strange. It has a biomorphic. And that's the reason I decided to work on it, because there may be some potential to work on it. And you have the control. It's a mirror image creature in the world. So, but yes, it's not 50-50. Not but in the tr tree snails, not freshwater snails, Sometimes in tropical countries, there may be 50 50, but of course, it's not scientifically <laughs> reported, so there's no proper statistics. But they said we may be 50 50. I heard, I read about it a long time ago, but it's not scientific paper. Yes. Thank you very much. And left again. <laughs> Hi. Um, in plants, there are also uh, helical. Uh, climbing plants, especially like ivy, ah. and so that uh, have, have a chirality. Do you think the principle of handedness goes back to the same principles as in the snails? No, it's not. It's, uh, there's some abdopsis and things, it's called spin one. Uh, that determined actually spindle. So it's a different scheme for the plants. And some people worked on it, yes. And someone in the middle, I thought, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for, your, for presenting your wonderful uh, work. Uh, my background is physics, so I have a question about the mechanical control of chirality. <laughs> um, so you said you, you can induce uh, so opposite chirality of the shell, mm. but the genes are still uh, yes. right-handed version. Yes. So I was wondering, is there any uh, like uh, issue between the outer shell and the inside, like the inner organs of the snail? Is there any chirality inside the, the, of course, the body of the shell? You are not changing the shell's shape only. Everything becomes mirror image. If you do micro manipulation at the s when it becomes four to cell, the eight cell stage. You can change everything. Because downstream, we had a nodal and PTX genes that de determines the re orientation, location, organ. All that expression sites also reversed. So everything goes mirror image. And the crucial point is that third cleavage. Okay, so at third cleavage, up to that, I think, I don't, didn't talk about it. It's the intracell interactions. After eight cell stage, I think intracell interaction determine chirality. It cannot. It has to be proven. It, but that's my idea, because when it goes to two to four cell stage at the second cleavage, I do the same thing. It reverts to the original chirality, and only at the third cleavage. Cell cell adhesion becomes solid, you cannot change it anymore. Then um, this expression of nodal PTX that determines organs positions in our body as well is determined. So that what it is. So not only shell, everything. Shell is actually produced after the internal soft organs. There's a shell gland. And shell, after shell ground is formed, then you see this is aragonite, and all its calcium start producing. So shell does not exist before, before soft body. Soft body, its shape produces this uh, shell ground. 
So that follows that way. Uh, when you when you do that force manipulation to cause it to choose the opposite chirality, do you find any difference in like the the healthiness of the of the the shells? <coughs> Snails. If you do it gently, they're very happy. <laughs> if you do it, push it too hard, and then you damaged the membrane, something, of course. So right, happy, but, but otherwise, the happy as... produces offsprings. Mm -hmm. Yes, so they don't seem to bother, but after each cell, you cannot do it. Mm. Okay, because it's cell cell adhesion become very established, you cannot do it. But before that stage, you can change it, but you, it goes back to the original chirality. How about the expression of the dia one gene? Is it expressed throughout the life cycle, or is it only in those beginning parts? Uh, it's go up to blastula uh, stage. It it is expressed. After that, it stops. But diaphanous one is maternal. Mm -hmm. However, after certain stage, zygotic expression starts. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that works as well. So it's it's becoming more complicated. But the first stage is only maternal. I guess it's me. Okay. I have the microphone. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, I have a question about uh, the multi-channel UCS. It uh -huh. could be a very short question, but I'm just curious. So what, what is your spatial uh, resolution on such an instrument? Is it, is it a bulk method, or can you focus on individual crystallites? And also, do you, do you go into the... Um, Sort of, uh, have you ever explored this idea of optical chiral gates, uh, something in the in this memory storage or information storage domain? Have I you, haven't uh, gone into any application, but still we are developing hmm. this. And actually, Heather, I tried to do it. And what happened is the Great Eastern earthquake. It fell off the bench, and it actually destroyed some crucial parts, and after that, it's very difficult to resume that. So it's not that come to stage. However, it's much channel, but you have to focus at certain wavelength stage. And if you want to do the wide wavelength stage, you have to fix it in other wavelengths. So you have to measure it that way. So it's not that simple, but it's very fast and you don't have to do, eliminate any other artifact signals because you're just electric shutter, you're just the choppers and electric shutter. You can pick up only circular polarized light, left-handed, right-handed. And because you're using the strong light, it's not the monochromatized. Therefore, you can get the very good um, intensity. But no, 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 not come to stage of anything to this. But it, if someone wants to work with me, I'm very happy. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much. I think it uh, really shows that how the, the micro and the macro really uh, have to think about it <coughs> yeah. together. Mm -hmm. And so many examples. And you have so many more uh, things so yes, maybe there will be some possibilities for collaboration. Yeah, I do hope so, because they said, you're old enough, go away. I said, no, 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 I want to do more. I <laughs> <The> more ideas. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> yeah, help me thank you, uh, Professor Kuruda, for this uh, wonderful uh, experience here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.